is imagination simply contained in the mind? Or does it tap into an unseen world with messages waiting to be told? There is a place where legends cross over into our world, where strange visions and whispers beckon and superstition takes hold. Step into the Black Cat's shadow. standing in front of you. He's talking to you. What's he saying? He's got your baby. 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 Welcome back to the Black Hat Shadow. I'm your co-host Andy, podcasting from Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm Phantom Dark Dave, coming at you from the heart of Texas. With us today, a guest who is a writer, director, and an actor who has over 80 credits to his name. He stays consistent in film and television, but may be most recognized for his role on The Walking Dead and his outstanding contributions in the James Wan universe. Please welcome to the show the man who rolls the dice and puts you into the house of pain, Mr. Steve Coulter. Wow, I like that. I roll the dice. <laughs> That's personalized for you, yeah. <laughs> That's very, very nice. <laughs> well, hi, guys. Um, yeah, so, Steve, uh, yeah, we're just really excited to talk to you and, and uh, let our listeners in on your world a little bit. And uh, and we always like to find out how people get started in the film industry. What was the, the thing that got you first into it? How did you get your foot in the door? I guess, you know, I'd always acted. I acted in high school because I was really shy. And uh, and like most actors, I didn't realize you could actually train <laughs> to do it. So I actually went to an acting school, which is weird because it's, it's a college, but there were literally 500 people there. And so it's not like, a you know, there's no sororities, fraternities. Our, our, we had no homecoming football game. Uh, we had a homecoming queen, and he was actually a queen. <laughs> he did play football. Um, so it's a weird environment, but it, you, you get a lot of training. I mean, you're, they train you in voice and combat and gymnastics and singing and dialects, and uh, they train you sort of to do everything. The odd thing is that they don't train you to do you know, sort of film and TV stuff, which is, is really a different kind of acting. Um but so I, when I came out, uh, you know, I went to New York for several years and did a lot of uh, theater and stuff. Of course, the first ten years of your career, you don't do you don't do much acting. You're mainly trying to survive. And you know, I drove trucks and I was a bouncer at a folk club, and uh, which that's a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, it's funny because you know, not to get political, but you know, they talk about the Hollywood elite, and you know, it's like well, but most. 99% of actors just had to do every kind of job, you know, waiting tables, bartending, driving, you know, I drove limos, I I put up drywall and stuff. Um, so I did that for about 10 years. And then I got my start in, in TV and film stuff back in the, gosh, it was like the, around 1990, 89, I did a TV movie called Wife, Mother, Murderer. Uh, it was one of those, you know, like kind of a lifetime kind of thing with, I think, Judith Light. They used to do a lot of those movies, all all based on actual murders of some poor person. And, uh, and actually, my resume for a while, it had like wife, mother, murder, with murder in mind, perfect murder. <laughs> Everything see that murder in it. Um, but slowly but surely, you sort of slowly build a, a, a resume and then you meet. Folks, uh, I like at any job, like you know, I, when I 
work with James Wan. I did one scene in a in the first Conjuring with him, and um, and it was it, you know went well, it was nice. And then I forgot all about it. And then about a year later, I got a call saying James Wan's trying to find you, and uh, to for the Insidious two. Um, and so that and little other kind of relationships like that. I recently did a Barry Levinson film, and I just did another one with him a year ago. So, it, like again, like in any job, you sort of build these relationships. And uh, the James Wan relationship is awfully fun because I think I've done like five things with him now. Um, so yeah, so that's and then you still just try to keep working. And um, and I and I wrote for a while. Acting was kind of slow, and I accidentally. Well, not accident, but I fell into writing a bit. So I did that for a few years when acting was kind of slow. And that, you know, I wrote was Tyler Perry's head writer, uh, hence the House of Pain, uh, which is the TV show. And um, so, yeah, it's been a pretty, I'm, I'm having fun. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and it's 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 really cool to see in those those James Wan pictures. Like you can tell that you guys have built a relationship there because he he's having you you know, in a lot of his different pictures. So that's that's kind of that's got to be kind of like a, oh an encouragement to, you know that he has faith in you to to keep bringing you on to his movies and stuff like that. Yeah, he's very he actually and he even stuck me in Fast and Furious because he knew I lived in Atlanta and he just called up. He actually gave me two parts. Originally he said, do you want to be in the movie? It was just two little parts and ended up just playing a priest. And then the second part we ended up cutting because when, when Paul died, they sort of redid the entire end of the movie. And that's where my other part would have been, but he's just a very generous guy and he's very loyal. He's, he, he, you know, he, he hires a lot of the same people, a lot of the same crew, and um yeah so that's that's awfully fun yeah i mean it makes sense you know once you work with somebody you kind of get a feel for them you know who they are you know they're dependable and so yeah it just makes sense to to kind of rehire the people you worked with in the past yeah i'm glad he does (laughs) yeah so so you being in atlanta was that a big uh part in you being on the walking dead tv series yeah, it's, it's odd because being in Atlanta at first, because, you know, like I said, I moved here from New York way back, golly, in 88, 87, because um, I'd come down here for a theater job, and I just never went back to New York. And um, for a while, it was tricky because there was very little film or TV work. Like I said, it was a lot of TV movies. And back then, the only projects that came here were really ones that would take place in the South. So I played a lot of Klansmen and deputies and with a lot i'm canadian but i did a lot of southern people um but then they had the they passed you know uh, there's a film tax incentive here so there's been an explosion of production and walking dead was one of the first uh uh shows to come here now there's literally there's about 50 tv shows shooting here uh, with every month and um so then you know all the marvel movies are shooting here now but um, and I'd auditioned for Walking Dead only once before. I'd auditioned for actually the role of Herschel, and I'm so glad they didn't cast me because uh, Scott Wilson is was is so great. Um, and then and I sort of thought I thought uh, and it's odd because I had been a, I'd watched the show from the very very beginning and I was a huge fan. And so when I got the audition and um, I really liked that part. And I don't know if you got you guys have probably heard, but when if you audition for Walking Dead, they disguise the scenes because they don't want any plot lines out. So you get basically a fake scene. Like the the audition scene for Reg Monroe was actually like I was talking to some guy who had had a, a TED talk, and you can kind of realize that that's probably Rick. <laughs> it was like at a book signing or something, um, and it ended up kind of resembling the episode where they have that party that they throw for the uh the you know the regulars the survivors uh, where there's like wine and drinks and stuff and they have to dress up um but i actually found out i got the job on my birthday that year and uh i was just you know as an actor i was like very excited but just as a fan it was like it's like getting to walk into your tv show because you go on with my first day on set i'm like you know you're behaving very professionally and all that and you've prepared but on the inside, you feel like a little kid because you're like, "There's Rick, and there's Michonne. <laughs> there's... so it's kind of fun. It's like it's like getting to play baseball with some of your heroes, sort of. It's like getting to take the field with them. Sure, yeah, definitely. I mean that 
yeah, that would be hard not to get starstruck seeing all those people that you've watched on TV for all those years. Yeah, and you never want to lose that because it's like, you know, and I, I've gotten to work with like Al Pacino a couple of times and and you're just tickled because, you, you know, I grew up watching these guys. And so to get to be sitting across from them actually doing your job, um, that's one of the funnest parts of it. You know, I don't think it's, I hope, hopefully I never get cynical about that. Cause it's, um, it's a lot of fun. So do you have a, like when you're, when you're looking at roles and you're, you're trying to decide and maybe you don't decide what you want to do, maybe you just take what comes to you, but do you have like a certain niche that, that you kind of go for or types of roles? That you look Literally. For? I just like something usually because you know, oftentimes it's like, Hey, I got to pay some bills. So you'll do, you know, and there's some stuff you won't do. It's just, you just don't like the material or, um, like there's been you know, recently there was a civil rights film that was being done, but you know, it was a, it was a kind of, it was a TV movie that I've seen those movies like 18 times and there was nothing really new in it. Um, and usually it's, you want to do something that's going to be hard. Like you read it and you go, gosh, I don't know how I could do that. Um, or it's, or it's, you know, something, one time I did a movie, it was an independent film and the director called me up. And he was, he'd done so much research. It was about a sort of a civil war film and he was going into all this research. And I just sort of interrupted him and I said, do I get, do I get a ride? Do I get to ride a horse? And he said, Oh yeah. And I went, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so that was like, if I get to ride a horse and have a holster, uh, that, that was my condition. So, you know, you try to do stuff that is, um, you know, I, I don't want to do anything that's just kind of, you know, like the certain horror stuff that was coming my way. I didn't, it was just not, really well written and um and so you don't you know if you know it's not gonna be any good you don't really want to do it but um so yeah that's mainly if, if it's good i'll do it and if they pay me too that's always really good yeah, that's a plus yeah so steve people who know me right. know that i absolutely adore the saw franchise the insidious franchise the oh, conjuring yeah. franchise the annabelle the whole universe that's that james wan is pretty much and lee wendell had created and yeah. something really particular about insidious for me is i actually said this on the air before and i'll say it again i actually prefer insidious 2 over insidious 1 they're both great films but there was something about part two that just blew my mind and I have a feeling that some people out there, especially in horror, usually will see the first movie and they don't make it through the part two or part three because when they see a sequel, they neglect it. And so what yeah. I wanted to start with you is, you know, you play a character named Carl. Can you tell our listeners who may have only seen the first film wh who your character is and what your character's like? Yeah, Carl was kind of a, an early friend of the Elise character. He was, uh, and they alluded it may have been something romantic, and he's kind of a mentor. He Particularly in Insidious 3, he shows up sort of just very briefly to guide her. And he is, uh, he has the gift of using these dice of uh, they can predict and offer him signs and messages. And so he's kind of a, uh, in a way, he's kind of a technical advisor uh, for, for Elise, she bring uh, he, when she needs help, he comes in, and he's but he's very, he's also tortured by the like the way that Elise is, which is again what James Wan does really well in Lee, is they they really humanize it. These people are are kind of realistically kind of tortured by the gift that they have. They kind of wish that they didn't have it because they see things they don't like. They see the evil in life. And uh, I'm sure they would much rather not have that gift, but they also feel an obligation to use that gift, which I thought was kind of cool, which is in a, in a way not to get too heady about it. But it's like, you know, some some folks, you know, in all walks of life have a gift that they know they have a calling for that may mean a lot of sacrifice and stuff. Uh, and so in a bigger sense, I think it's kind of neat that they have these characters that, you know, f sort of follow a calling um, so it's not just, oh, why are they doing this? There's a real reason why they're part of that story. It's not just thrown in as a horror device, you know, which is another reason why I think their films are so successful. They really touch a nerve in the same way I think Stephen King does. And maybe we'll have time to talk about it, which I just saw, which I thought was very, very good. Perfect. And you said something there, too. You talk about 
you know, sometimes the characters wish they didn't have the certain gifts because now they're on the pedestal as being the person who has to resolve it. And yeah. I was I was going to ask you, in playing the role of Carl, um, you know, typically, you know, you talked about your Lifetime films there, and then you went on a trend where, you, you know, you didn't really make horror movies. And this kind of, to me, kind of put you in the spotlight uh, for at least the horror fans because now you're very yeah. recognizable. In going in this, I had saw in an interview – that you had mentioned when you read the script, you were generally scared about it. And so I was wondering, oh, yeah. when reading the script and making the decision to move forward with it, what's it like to then be on set? How do you get over you know, your fears with that? Because you know, you filmed in an abandoned hospital. That can't be too easy. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because yeah, cause actually shooting is a whole lot of fun. It's like being 12 years old again. Because you have all these toys and, you know, because they really, you get real, you know, as a kid, you're, you're pretending stuff. You got to make it all up yourself and you don't have props and stuff. But they have, like, for example, when we did um, Conjuring 2, they had a scene which uh, wasn't in the cut, but it's it's in the Warren sort of memorabilia room, you know, the where they have all, where they have Annabelle and all this stuff. And it was filled to the brim with these amazing props and actually had Annabelle in a case. There was a scene where I go to it. And um, so, so that part is actually fun. What is not fun. (laughs) And it's funny that you mentioned it is like working in that abandoned hospital because that was a real place. It was not a set. Um, And, and I was talking, you know, you have a lot of time in between camera setups and I was talking to a, a resident of that neighborhood where the hospital is. And it had been closed, I think, around 10 years or so. And we were shooting way down, one of the, one of the locations inside. You know, first of all, we're shooting you know, in the middle of the night. And uh, I found out from this guy who lived in the neighborhood that there had actually been a, a rape and murder in that hospital basement. And so normally, you know, when you're on set, you sort of, you wander around the location, just, you know, and I did not wander because it was genuinely, there was a lot of just sort of, there was a real resonance to it of, uh, of, of fear. And, um, of course, one of the things they said at one point, Lee came out to me, so we got to show you something. And we went down this hallway and I went into this room and Angus Simpson was I had huddled in a corner in this dark room to scare the crap out of me. <laughs> and, um, but you're also like, we were looking at, we were in this records room and they had, uh, actual, this, they still had the records in this room. So you're looking at these files of these thousands of people who had suffered and were ill. And so that's, that's where it gets genuinely creepy. Other than that, it really is kind of fun because you're playing pretend and running through mist and, uh, pretending stuff. And so they're actually doing it, but the seeing of it, because I actually, when I went to see it, you know, about a week ago, I had to go with another person. And I think I, I mentioned once before uh, talking to someone that when um, Insidious 2 was coming out, you know, they, you have to do, you're doing press interviews and stuff. So they send you uh, a, a screener to watch. And I had to watch it on my laptop in the middle of the day with all the curtains open standing about five feet back from my laptop because <laughs> it's a scary movie. It's odd. It's kind of like roller coasters. I love them, but I hate them because I, they, especially, you know, films that are about, you know, not so much maybe, uh, uh, well, I don't know. Cause the saw movies terrified the crap out of me too. But when you're, you know, touching on genuine evil, you know, which I think exists in the world, um, then it's kind of, it just, it scares the crap out of me. Yeah, no kidding. I can only imagine, you know, being on set and you're, you're walking through the hospital and you get all the ideas in your head, your mind plays tricks on you, and then now the crew and the cast is playing tricks on you. That's just mean. Yeah. <laughs> it was very mean, but it was very funny. At any point, did you use that fear that you had to put into the role of Carl? Because I noticed what I really liked about Carl is everybody can relate to him because if we ourselves had the gift, you know, of rolling the dice and that's how we communicate. And, you know, we're not Elise, but we're the next best thing. We're the we're filling the shoes now. We're the one everybody looks at. His role, you can see sometimes it was some uncertainty and a lack of confidence that he had himself until he had to step up for it. And I didn't know if maybe yeah. 
you know, some of that was relative to just like, okay, let's just get through this scene because this is a really creepy place. <laughs> yeah, you really you try to tap into. It's weird, and not to sound like a bonehead actor, but you try to tap into your real fears, and you just try to f- sort of like fan that little flame of of that pretend. Because uh, there's a fun thing about acting that I, that in all my study of it that. Um, your brain, like, you know, the left part of your brain, the smart analytical part is saying, oh, this is just a movie and da, 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 da. But the right part of your brain, the little pretend part doesn't know that. And so you try to really give over to that, the darkness and the, and especially that uncertainty of not knowing what is coming up. And so you really try to let that, instead of, it's weird because in, in real life, you would try to block out that fear. You know, being in that hospital, for example, uh, not knowing what's around the next corner and stuff, you would block it out and say, no, I'm fine. Whereas what, you, the, what the messages I had to keep giving myself was, it's not fine. You don't know what's going to come up, what's going to be around the corner, are they? And so you really try to, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. You're trying to encourage yourself to be uncomfortable and be afraid. Because again, you, you made a very good point that a character like Carl, audiences relate to because you know i think you know when i watch a movie or read a book you you kind of put yourself in the place of the main characters and uh that's why it's like yeah i would be scared doing that and uh, so you just tap into that and i think that's another thing that james Wan does successfully he really knows his audience he knows what scares people so you know his his protagonists aren't invincible at all they're very flawed and they're not good at what they do all the time <laughs> and they make mistakes and they're terrified and uh i think that's yeah i think that's why people identify with him yeah no kidding he uh he manages to really bring some scary stuff to the screen and that that actually puts me into this position i was going to say you know some people consider the exorcist to be one of the scariest films of all time um i think james wan has managed to bring that same type of fear back and you hear stories yeah. of you know unexplained things that happen on set when filming The Exorcist, and some people say you know it was relative to the subject matter. And I was wondering, you know, with the darkness of the, of the few movies you got to participate in, from Insidious to Conjuring, was there anything similar to that? Any unexplained rarities? The, I was lucky. I didn't have that. I, I've had that in my life where I experienced that. And that's another thing I sort of tapped into, knowing this that you know in the back of my head was always this isn't. You know, this isn't just a fantasy pretend thing. This stuff um, exists where there's real, you know, a genuine terror in the world. There's a, you know, the 9-11 attacks. I remember feeling that. It's like, this is evil winning. Um, but luckily, I, I do know of, like, I think Barbara Hershey had an experience. Um, and I know a couple other people. I was fortunate <laughs> that I did not have... Uh, any any untoward experiences? I, w- I was lucky in that way. I'm glad I did not. I would probably never do another horror film again if that had <laughs> happened to me. But I have had experiences with just sort of genuine, an experience of genuine evil, and that I don't wish that on anybody. Yeah, no, definitely not. Now, did I hear you right? Did you say Barbara Hershey had something on set? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what it oh, was. Geez. She, but it was what it was a really neat thing that she's you know and this is kind of um you know things with the supernatural you know obviously they make a lot of films about the negative evil things and i wish i could remember specifically what it was but she had a very positive it was like a little uh, very positive kind spirit that she glimpsed or something and I, I, darn it i wish i could remember the story but it was a very comforting uh uh, uh kind of visit that she had um, well, and positive so is crazy. always good. So, yes, they're not going to make many movies about that. But, but yeah, it wasn't like an evil demon. It was like someone who was very happy in the afterlife who kind of visited her. Well, yeah, no kidding, because, I mean, it's Barbara Hershey. Everybody knows her from the entity, which was not a positive thing. Yeah. And I'm like, no. she's probably thinking, here we go again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I noticed, sadly... You are not credited for Insidious The Last Key. However, what I did notice is that it's not kept you out of the horror scene entirely. And you have yeah. three things coming out that kind of fit the genre. And I wanted to know if you wanted to you know, tell us a little bit about some upcoming films and or TV series you get to be in. You know, one thing that's really cool that's coming up is, um, is it's, a, it's a limited series coming out on Amazon based on the podcast lore. And it is genuinely 
you know, they're each, each, uh, I think there are six episodes and each one is a self-contained story. A lot along the lines of, I don't know if you guys remember Night Gallery. Oh yeah. Um, that right. And, uh, and, and each episode is genuinely terrifying. Um, and they're all based on actual, uh, sort of events and folklore. You know, it's not, it's not fiction. It's based on, you know, I don't know if you know the podcast lore, but they do these stories of things that actually happen, uh, in the country that were, um, pretty awful. <laughs> and, um, I don't want to spoil it, but it's, it's really fans of horror will really be, uh, excited because they're great stories, genuinely terrifying. And I wouldn't recommend watching alone. Yeah, yeah. we're definitely looking forward to it. Cause you know, there's been a, a relaunch in horror for television, especially when yeah. American horror story came out that stirred things up and Salem came out and now it's a big deal. Yeah. They have, you know, the stuff on Netflix and now, like you said, Amazon. I was looking at the lore stuff, and I do love Night Gallery, and Andy does too. We're actually big Rod Serling fans. We had a Twilight yeah. Zone episode uh, not too long ago, but oh, cool! When I first was looking at lore, I actually was thinking more like um, like Tales from the Crypt, where, like you said, each episode yes, is self-contained, yes. and I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I'm so happy like we're that. doing this again. <laughs> yeah, and it's great. And there's another, there's a series coming out. I actually just auditioned for it, uh, based on the Haunting of Hill House, called The Haunting. And I just read the pilot script, which I can't divulge because I have a non-disclosure agreement. And I read the script, and it is absolutely terrifying. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a real uh, audience for that. And along those lines, I've never met better fans than, than horror fans because we do you know, a lot of these conventions and stuff. And they're the most loyal, knowledgeable, kind um, some of them are a little strange, but the majority, and it's a family thing, which is odd. A lot of families watch these things together. It's kind of a, again, I think it's like, you know, riding a roller coaster. It's a very, it's a communal thing. Like when I went to see it, I knew it was on like a Saturday night and I wanted to see it in a whole, you know, audience full of, of people because it's a, there's something about being terrified in a huge group of people that's, uh, it's really exhilarating and fun and awful. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I think that makes the experience all the more enjoyable sometimes is when you're in a room full of people that are enjoying the movie oh, yeah. just as much as you. And because, you know, you yeah. hate that whenever you're in the movie theater and there's like, I don't know, like people that aren't taking it seriously and, the, and they're kind of making yeah. fun of the movie and it just really ruins. So definitely like the, the people around you definitely add to that. That, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Ambiance. It's hard. Say? Like horror movies are hard. You got to be very sophisticated these days to genuinely scare people because we're all, as an audience, all of us are pretty knowledgeable. You know, we know what those scares are, and so you have to to surprise someone. You uh, you really have to do your homework um, to really make it original. And uh, uh, like I have not watched American Horror Story because just the previews are too scary. <laughs> I, haven't seen a, I haven't seen a minute of that show so it's too scary for me well Steve uh, it's been a blast talking to you today we just want to thank you for taking the time to come on the sure. show and, and share some behind the scenes stories from your movies and get give our listeners a chance just to get to know you a little bit better Sure. I, oh, I have, a question. have you guys seen it? Um, Dave has seen it but I have not yet oh you gotta see it so Dave what did you think? you really want to know? <laughs> Yes, no, I do, I do, I do, because uh, some people, some people love it, some people do not like it at all. I've been known to go on a forty-five minute tangent, so I'll I'll drop it to a forty-five second tangent, and I will tell <laughs> you, in my opinion, at a scale of one to ten, one being awful, ten being great, I only give it a five, and here's the reason. Okay, well, yes, um, the original was great, and there's no replacing Tim Curry, and that has nothing to do yeah. with the score. What I feel yeah. happened in the film was the cast was amazing. The guy who plays Pennywise is amazing. The entire group of kids were just as great as the group of kids from the original. Loved it. Yeah. They lost me with the fact that they were able to have a rated R and that they had a bigger budget. And so I think it took away from what could generally be scary when you have to put the fear into the audience rather than show ah. it to them. And I think with yeah. the CGI and with just some of the, the things they changed – I feel like it hurt the film rather than helped it. And yeah. I I see both sides. People love it. Uh, I think it, it definitely 
goes to a certain type of horror audience for sure. Um, but me, I'm much more of a practical guy and I felt like it showed too much and that it, honest to truth, it was really funny. I loved mm-hmm. the chemistry with the, with the kids and, um, I, I hate yeah, that was my favorite movie, part but... about it. Yeah, that was my, cause I like, you know, remember stand by me. Yeah, yeah this was stand got, by me with a clown. That's what it was. Exactly. That's and I think that's what that's sort of what I liked about it is that they got that like the you know the stuff of the the, the families that they grew up in like the real horror is is sort of that and playing on the kids' fears of that that camaraderie. But um, yeah, they did have a big budget that they and I'm looking I'm looking forward to the the second part with the uh, with the grownups because I remember reading the book way back when and yeah. and I really love the murder because that's really that that is the story of those guys revisiting that and going back to something they then never ever wanted to go back to. So I'm really curious what they what they do with that. And hopefully I still don't know how they'll fix the ending of it with the giant spider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, and that's where I'm a little nervous too, because if the best part of the original was the kids, so now we're gonna get yeah. the, another movie without the kids, you're really gonna have to pull together some yeah. great talent to play our adult characters in the film. And I, was I don't thinking, think yeah. I don't think they'll go the spider route. They may do like something to reference it, um, especially yeah, showing like everything the they, they did, showed the... before. Exactly. Yeah, that's how I was thinking. Is like they because the spider just again because of audiences evolving. Even when I read the book, I was like, seriously, that's it? It's an alien spider something thing? I, I agree. They'll probably have to do something else because uh, it sort of improve on that. Because yeah, I think they've got their work cut out for them, but. Uh, all right, that, no, good. I was, I was really curious what, the, what what you thought. Well, uh, Steve, I maybe... A, a, I gave it a seven. <laughs> maybe after the second part of It comes out, we'll bring you back on the show. We'll talk yes. about your current projects and we'll get your review. <laughs> yeah. that, that sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, uh, you know, Steve, like I said, it, it's been really fun talking to you. We're, we're really thankful to have the opportunity to sit down with you and, and hear... And hear stories from from you and and hear how you got started and just get to know you better as a person. So thanks once again. Oh, Oh, vice versa. Same with you two. This is how you die. Not today. It is today. Come on, bitch. With us today, a guest who has graced us with his presence for over 54 years. He has had a successful career in theater, television, short films, and full-length features. He has appeared on such television programs as NCIS, New Girl, Rush Hour, The League, and Baby Daddy. However, it was his role in the films Insidious 2 and 3 that got him on this podcast. Please welcome to the show, the bride in black, old Parker himself, Mr. Tom Fitzpatrick. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So, Tom, what we figured we'd do is I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about a few things. I want people to really get to know who you are, and then I'm going to hand it off to Andy, and we'll get some of those insidious questions that we're dying to uh, hear answers to. But first off, it was such a huge resume. Where does this all go back to? What got you into acting in the first place? What got me into acting in the first place? I'm really old, man. I'm, uh, I'm 76 now, and so I was born in 1941. And I was raised on a farm in southwestern New York State, just me and a bunch of cows, my brother and my mother and father, really isolated. And finally, in 1951, we got one of those newfangled things, a television set. And <laughs> before that, we had already like listened to the radio, kind of huddled around the radio every night, you know, the way people did back then. So we got a TV, and I sat down in front of that television set in 1951. And I didn't get up again until I went off to college in 1959. I was glued to that TV set. And I was just a kid. I was 10 years old. And uh, a lot of the pro- programming in those days, they didn't have any TV programming. So they, the TV uh, networks bought a lot of the B pictures from the studios, which were hurting for money back then. So they were running B westerns all the while. And I was crazy about them. And there were kids in these Westerns. And I remember asking my mom, this is probably not politically correct, but I said, Mom, are those kids or are those, I didn't know the right word, are they midgets, said I, 
Uh, and she said, no, honey, those are kids. And right then I said, inside my head, I didn't tell her, but I said, I'm going to be one of those kids. I want to be one of those kids. Uh, and that was when I decided that I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to be in the movies. I always wanted to be in the movies. Uh, but there I am. I'm on a farm in southwest New York State. I'm 300 miles from New York City. I'm 3,000 miles from uh, Los Angeles, California. And my folks are really nice, but farm people. They're simple farm people. So I never, <laughs> never got to New York until I was grown up and didn't make it out here for years. Uh, but the way to go back to those days was if you were in New York State and you wanted to be uh, an actor, you went to uh, colleges that had theater departments. So I went to um, a college called Ithaca College, really good theater department, worked all the while. Uh, went to Boston University afterwards, really good theater department, worked all the while there. And every summer, back in those days, we had stuff called summer stock, and that was where mostly young actors with no experience would go out into the countryside and literally you'd get like a, a barn or something like that in a town and you would put on shows and so I did that for for six summers every summer you'd go out and I you would do 10 shows in 10 weeks so I did that once I really was in a barn two summers I was in a barn on the fairgrounds in Worcester Ohio doing 10 shows a week, making 25 bucks a week and a place to stay and they would feed you. It was mostly macaroni and cheese every day. Uh, but that's how I got my experience. Then I went to New York, which was the route for Eastern actors back in those days. Kids who are actors back East, you went to New York and uh, did what I could, you know. I uh, did off, off Broadway, they used to call it. I mean, you know, little holes in the wall. Uh, I didn't really get a lot of exposure to big time theater except for one gig. I uh, There was a really good repertory company then called the APA Phoenix. This is 1967, 68. And I worked for them for a season. Uh, there were 12 of us kids that they had auditioned you know, to get us. And they thought we were potential and talented and everything. So basically, we're, we were like spear carriers and we played tiny parts. Uh, $75 a week. I remember that. Uh, but you could live on it in those days. Then I, um, I went back to Boston with a, a show that became a big hit up there. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It was based on the novel. And we ran like two years in Boston. And by then, I had pretty much gotten tired of New York because New York is tough, baby. So I decided to stay in Boston with some partners and we started a theater company. But then in 1978, I got tired of trying to do that. That's really hard. And I really didn't have any skills at being a producer, even though I thought I did. I learned that I didn't <laughs> as I went along. Uh, and then there was a terrible winter in Boston. And I said, the heck with this, man. I want to go to I, okay, I said Hollywood. I want to go to Hollywood. I've always wanted to be in Hollywood. And so I got a tour of a show. Uh, it was a production of, they made a play out of The Little Prince, that uh, famous kid's book, The Little Prince. And we toured all over the Midwest. Didn't pay very good, but I saved every penny. And I remember our last gig was in Dayton, Ohio. And I bought a plane ticket and I flew out to the West Coast. And I got out here with 30 bucks in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I had some friends whose uh, couch I could sleep on. So I was in their living room for a month. And I've been here ever since. Um, I had a bit of good luck when I first came out here. You always have beginner's luck. And uh, I knew a casting director from back in Boston. She was out in L.A. And she was casting. She cast a series of television movies that Joanne Woodward was making. Miss Woodward was kind of a pioneer of that. They were television movies, really well done, beautiful stories, and they were woman-centered, which was really cool. And uh, I had a little tiny part in one of her things called The Streets of L.A., so that got me my SAG membership. And then you just plug along, and you plug along, and you plug along, you try to get an agent. I had some 
really bad agents <laughs> and some good agents. And uh, you just build your resume. I think the, I'm trying to think, I think the first gig I got uh, in television was something called The Oldest Rookie. I remember it starred Paul Sorvino, the late Paul Sorvino. Um, then I got in uh, America's Most Wanted and uh, a bunch of other sitcoms. You can see them on my IMD resume. And I just kept building. Meanwhile, uh, you know, I'm doing the actor's route, trying to get an agent and doing one or two day long uh, TV gigs and trying to get into movies. Um, then I met this guy uh, and I auditioned for him. He was a, a theater director and his name was Reza Abdo. And he was Iranian American. He had, uh, his family had been really big with the Shah of Iran. So they had a flea for their lives <laughs> a few years before and they wound up in LA and he was 22 years old when I met him and I was already 44 years old. I mean, I've been knocking around for years and he was like a genius. I could, I did one show with him and I said, man, this guy is the real deal. And I never really liked doing theater. You know, it's, it doesn't appeal to me. It's a lot of people love it. I don't like it. I like movies. I like movies and TV. I like to be in front of the camera. That's where I always wanted to be right in front of the camera. I don't want to be anyplace else. Uh, but I would do theater because it's supposed to be good practice or some damn thing. So I would do it. Uh, but uh, this guy was different. He, uh, he had a really interesting head on his shoulders. He was really political. He saw all the things that are wrong with the power structure that runs the United States and stuff like that. And he made plays about it. And they were, uh, they were not ordinary plays. They were, they would jump around in time and there was a lot of spectacle and a lot of dance and a lot of, you know, fighting and a lot of, a lot of, it was, somebody once said they were like operas without any singing in them. There was singing, but none of us could sing very good. So you didn't want to hear us. But it was really exciting to work with this guy. It was, it was, you know, if I couldn't get into movies, this was a good second. So I worked with this guy from 1985 when I met him and did the first show until 1995 when he died. Um, and I did 10 plays in those 10 years. And we started out doing little shows in lofts on Hollywood Boulevard. And he caught on with people who book plays, especially in Europe. And we got all these bookings in Europe. I played, uh, I counted up one day, I played 15 European capitals in plays by Reza Abdo all over Europe. It was fabulous. And the cool thing was he never caught on too much over here, but over there they thought we were the greatest thing since sliced bread. So they made a big fuss over us and you got to go into people's homes because they thought you were somebody special, you know? <laughs> Back in those days, the early 90s, people in Europe were very, very, very kind and very sweet, and they still loved Americans. I don't know how they feel about us nowadays, but, but they just loved us. They welcomed us. So I really got to see Europe in a great way. Um, and anyway, he, was, uh, he uh, was an AIDS victim. He died in 95. And then uh, I'm back on the streets again, basically, and I hooked up with a really good manager whom I still have, a woman named Eileen O'Farrell, salt of the earth, hardest working woman in Hollywood, and we're great friends. I, I, I dearly love her. And she's managed me ever since, and she kind of picked up my career where it was, and she was a worker. She got me out for so many auditions, and that's when my resume starts to get fatter. Again, it was only, yeah, it was like day gigs, two days, and stuff like that. But I don't know if you've ever realized it. You know, you watch the great old pictures from the golden era, these, you know, things from the 30s and the 40s, and you say, oh, my God, everybody in that movie is fabulous. You know, and you'll see people like Walter Brennan. And uh, there was a great character guy named William Demarest and a great character guy named uh, Walter Catlett. And uh, just these amazing character faces. And they're the things you remember from those pictures. 
But then thinking soberly about those things, you realize those people were great and they were working one day gigs. They were working two day gigs. They shot that fabulous scene in like two days. So I'm proud to be a day player or a week player. Uh, that's what everybody is out here, really, except for the lucky few that break through uh, and, and become stars, people that they can hang movies from, you know, they get they get names. And that's just an accident of genetics because you wound up looking good or it's an accident of uh, talent. Some of us have more talent than others, frankly, it just it happens. Uh, and being in the right place at the right time. That's what makes people be stars, you know. And then some people are smart and strong and they know how to make it work and last forever like Tom Cruise, God bless him, indestructible, just indestructible. He looks the same way he did 30 years ago. He loves what he does, you can tell, and he does it very well. People like him and then, you know, the, the road to hell is littered with all the poor burnouts, the people that just, for one reason or another, had a hit or two and couldn't cut it. It takes a lot of work to maintain a career. And some people can do it and some people can't. Um, so anyway, she got me She got me out all the while. From those days, I think it was only one day, but she got me into The Salt and Sea, which starred Val Kilmer. Yeah, kind of a good movie. Didn't really go very far. Um, and that was great. They wanted me to sing. And God help them. I had to audition even singing. But I think the gag was the guy couldn't sing. It was supposed to be a really skanky karaoke bar downtown L.A. And that was certainly where we shot it. You've never seen a worse place than that place. And I was supposed to do the uh, uh, Lou Reed song, Take a Walk on the Wild Side. And they gave me, they gave me you know, the track of the music. And they also gave me the Lou Reed recording and a copy of the lyrics. My friends, I must have worked 50 hours nonstop on getting that damn song right. Oh, I worked so hard. Gosh, I worked hard, just nonstop. And uh, I went down, that we shot a night, it was a night shoot, 12 midnight or something, I get there, and they're gonna cover me first. They're gonna do the old geezer. And I was in a wheelchair. I was carrying out my character just for laughs, they called him Karaoke Joe. I'm in a wheelchair. I got a backup of three ladies behind me and I did the whole goddamn thing. I think I maybe went through it four times, probably. And they, they totally, from beginning to end, they, they recorded it. And I was really tickled because, you know, I can't sing, but I did my best. The cameraman at least loved me. <laughs> he, he thought I was great. And he kept wanting to do another take and another take and another take. And so I did. And then Mr. Kilmer and the, the talking actors came in. And I was, I think by then I had been recorded. So they didn't even uh, have me sing out loud. And they didn't even play the playback because they wanted to get the dialogue. So I think mostly they just... Uh, I think I did the whole thing pantomime, you know, and I wound up not being in much. I was kind of sad. Uh, it's mostly the actors talking in the front and me singing in the background, but at least they dropped in my sound. But anyway, that was a memorable occasion for me. And I, uh, for some reason, I appealed to the editors and they uh, called me up and they wanted to know if I wanted any outtakes in that scene. And foolishly, I took some outtakes, but I didn't ask for the four takes that the cameraman had done of that song. So you have to take my word. I was hilariously good. <laughs> and it's lost for all time. But that was the fun thing. Um, what else? Um, when I was in New York, I was doing my last show with Reza Abdo before he died. It was about 93 or 94. And I signed up with a... Um, an extra agency just to get out of the house because otherwise you're sitting around uh, a, a dump in New York waiting to do a show at night and that was getting on my nerves. So I signed up with an extra agency and they called me right away 
they uh, they were shooting uh, a, a movie called The Basketball Diary, starring Leo DiCaprio, and they they needed a bunch of skanky looking guys to be the habitués of a men's restroom at the Skirmerhorn subway stop because uh, that lead character in that book finally is reduced to being a male hustler because he doesn't have any money and he's got he's got a habit he's got to feed. So he's a young male hustler. And I was supposed to be one of about 10 guys hanging out in this men's room in a subway stop in New York. And the night that I came over to shoot, they had one old geezer who was supposed to be the main guy. And he had a scene where he buys Leo's services and then says, let's go into the men's room. And uh, frankly, goes down on Leo, if you want to know the truth. Well, that old guy got cold feet. He didn't think it would be good for his career. Uh, and so they were looking around. And I don't know. I don't know if I, I didn't have to audition, but I think they tapped me. I, I filled the bill. So I got to act with Leo DiCaprio, sort of. Uh, I wasn't allowed to say any dialogue. Leo and I had a great improvised scene of me buying his services, but they were so damn cheap. If I had spoken, they would have had to make me uh, a SAG actor. And I was already SAG, but they would have had to pay me SAG wages for a speaking actor. They wanted me silent as an extra. So we did the whole beautiful scene that we, we had, uh, worked out uh leo and me we did it uh miming it we did not speak and so i purchased his services and we we bargained and then i said okay youngster come into the men's room with me and then uh we went inside the men's room that was a, a different setup and then uh into one of the booths we go and i peeled off his little watch cap that he was wearing and i tried to kiss him and he repels me he repulses me and then he kind of pushes me down on him. So down I go on Leo DiCaprio. We had to do that thing eight days. <laughs> I got to know Leo DiCaprio. Uh, of course, obviously nothing happened once I got down there, but it's, it's really funny. So I always say that I gave uh, Leo DiCaprio his first screen kiss. I did get, get on his cheek before he pushed me away. Uh, <laughs> so that was a memorable thing from the 90s. Um, I did uh, a funny bit. It's only like a day's work, but people remember it in a date movie. They got me all done at this Gandalf, beard and all, and unrecognizable. And I, the kids are trying to sell the ring in a, in, a, in a pawn shop because they want money to go to Vegas. And I come in as Gandalf and you know, I'm horrified, horrified. And I did my best, uh, Sir Ian. McKellen imitation as Gandalf and then one of them kicked me in the balls and I kind of collapsed and I said, oh my precious and down I go so that was that was a fun day um then I started to get uh work started to come in more often and I'm trying to think well listen that you can see a lot of stuff you know how I get things get thicker uh from about 1999 through the 2000s. There is a, I do have a web series now that I'm kind of proud of. Uh, there's a very, very, very fine local playwright out here named Justin Tanner. And he was, he started to get really noticed in the mid 80s, all through the 90s in theater around town. But they snapped him up to write sitcoms. And he tried that for a while. And he, he's really, really sensitive. And he couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand being in the writer's room. He hated it. So he didn't last long. But somehow he managed to get by. And he still does plays. I started doing plays with him. Just because he he's like a genius. Not like my friend Reza. But he's a comic genius. He writes really, really good dialogue. It sounds like the way people talk. And he's really into like middle class life, especially in California, kind of the way people behave out here. So I did a number of his plays just to stay busy and keep in practice. And then he started making a web series, which is called Avenue 43. And you can find it online. It's on, uh, I guess it's on YouTube. It's got 74 or 75 episodes. And they're spooky and, and weird and crazy. 
and there's just the ghost of a plot or about 15 plots. And I maybe did, I must have done 50 of those things. We would go out every Saturday to his house out in Highland Park, which is one of the suburbs of LA. He doesn't like to leave his house. I think he's an agoraphobic. And he would have the script for us. We'd shoot maximum an hour. Everybody would be guaranteed to be out in an hour. And he would shoot all day, different scenes, and uh, edit it together himself. He does his own editing, his own sound, his own writing, of course. He mans the camera. And I think they're pretty good, so take a look at them. One of them that's really funny is uh, episode 54. That's my favorite one from my character. My character is like this old geezer in Highland Park, and somehow he has money. I think mostly because he makes porn. He's a, he's a, he's a Highland Park porn manufacturer and drug dealer. So this is an episode where I kind of explain who my character is and what my life is. And I, I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of it. It makes me laugh. It's very funny. So Avenue 43, episode 54. Go on and look at it. Uh, I'm still doing those. He finally, he did them for about four years. Every goddamn weekend we, we shot. Every weekend. He's finally run out of steam and he's way into music and he's a good singer and musician. So he's gotten with a musical group now and that's taking his attention away from Avenue 43. So finally, we're getting a break from going out to uh, Highland Park every every Saturday. Well, Tom, I'm going to I'm going to jump in right there because you've said so much fascinating stuff. It seems it's really impressive to me because your your passion for this goes all the way back to the childhood when you're watching television. (laughs) And what I caught on was, you know, you're watching TV and you're not like, Mom, you know, I want to play you know, cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, the traditional, like, I want to go outside and be that. You you already recognize there's something on the tube. I can <laughs> do that. I, I want to be an actor. Like, you, you didn't even want to be the character. You want I want to portray that character on screen. So I think that's fascinating. Wasn't that interesting? Ten years old. I, I wanted to go into that damn television tube. I wanted to get on the other side of the glass and be one of those kids. Right away, I copped to the fact that, you know, they were people pretending which I had no frame of reference. I don't even know how I knew that they were people pretending. You get what the universe or whatever you believe in wants you to get. And I think, you know, the universe wanted me to be an actor, which is why I've always, you know, I've never gotten famous and I've never gotten rich, but I have a great time. I love it. Every time I get on the set and in front of the camera, I'm in, I'm in pig heaven. I just adore it. There's nothing I like better. So I think I was meant to be here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And it's funny you say that because a lot of that shows through. When I watched a lot of your demo reels on IMDb and just tried to to get to know you as a person before getting to ask you more specific questions, I was like, man, this guy, he seems like – one, he's very down to earth, which is which is going to make this really fun. But two, he has a lot of fun doing this. And when the camera gets on you, like you really do bring these roles to life. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. It's interesting, you know, when you when you shoot, obviously you shoot like generally the process is you know this. You shoot the master, which is a picture of the whole set and both people in it, and then you do they do coverage. They do they do the other guy and they do you, or they do you and they do the other guy, you know. Um, and I try always to do exactly the, give the same amount of energy, but I watch myself and <laughs> I'm like Gloria Swanson at the end of Sunset Boulevard when it's my coverage when that camera is on me. I do fill up with a little more energy than I have when I'm giving the lines to the other guy in his goddamn shot. <laughs> I, I definitely come alive when the camera points at me. So I think that's indicative that uh, I'm doing what I wanted to do, but I wish I could be a little less selfish. I'm probably not selfish, but it would be nice to be to give more, you know. But that, that's the way I am. I love feeling that camera on me. And, and, and now, I mean, I've been acting for years in front of the camera, but I'm learning more and more to respect the camera. And the damn thing is magic. You cannot lie ever to the camera. And all you really have to do to the camera is think. That's really all you have to do. 
The camera will take care of everything. The camera catches every damn thing you do. It catches, a, it makes a picture of your damn soul. It really does. So, having come from all those years in theater, and as I told you, some of it was like really big theater, uh, I had to scale back and scale back and scale back and scale back and just know that it's okay to just sit there and think and just sit there and talk to the to the other person you know you you don't have to you don't have to give it anything because the camera takes a picture of an actor giving too much you know you wind up looking at a ham bone if, if, if you if you try to give too much the camera will say oh okay i'm going to take a picture of a guy giving too much and there it will be immortalized for all time on the screen you know sometimes i'm lucky because I think maybe casting people or directors sense that I've got this tendency to go large if I have permission. And sometimes I will get parts that kind of let me uh, do that and spoof that. Uh, I kind of do that in uh, Eagle Heart. I pay, play an old, you saw it, I'm an old failed director. And I, I'm trying to make a spoof of my one hit that I ever had, my... The picture hit. I can't remember the title. Uh, what the hell is it? I can't remember the title. Anyway, I'm trying to make a spoof. And none of the actors that I use in the original picture will come back for the spoof. So I kill them all and I preserve them with uh, formaldehyde. And I puppet, I kind of puppet them around. And so I play him very large, very large. He's, he's you know, what's his name? What the hell is his name? I can't remember, but he's very big and all right, lights, camera, action, you know, much bigger than real life. Hello. But I kind of kind of do it, and I know I'm doing it. It'd be funny. So that sort of thing. But uh, what's going to say? I shot something today, Monday. I shot something on Saturday that I'll, I'll give you a shout and let you know as soon as it's out there. It's going to be on a web series, which is called Driven. And it's by a fellow named, uh, it's produced by directed by a guy named Stephen Elliott. He uh, is out from New York, but he wrote a, a hit book called The Adderall Diaries. Did you ever hear of that? I said I recognize the title, Adderall Diaries. And then uh, he had a big personal success with that. And he's a pretty sensitive guy, as you can imagine, somebody that gets addicted to Adderall. So uh, the success kind of freaked him out. And so he shot an, uh, uh, a film about his success, and it's called After Adderall. So he's got kind of a rep reputation, and he's really a writer, but he also appears to want to be an actor. So he uh, was, I was recommended to him by a fellow actor, and I worked with him on Saturday, and I tried to be really small and really honest, and I'm this mean old guy in a, in a Lyft taxi. The whole thing about the uh, the film is that mostly it's shot in cars. It, uh, and I'm talking about my days when I could fight. So, uh, and my character had a lot of dialogue. I talked my head off. So I'm really interested to see how that comes out. He's good. He's very good. So I don't think I had a point. I think I'm just rambling. <laughs> and that's okay. Rambling is completely fine. But, you know, you mentioned that, you know, when the camera comes on, you tend to be uh, larger than life. And, you know, that's something I want to talk about because – in the first Insidious movie in 2010, it's a phenomenal film. And who knew it would go on to be, you know, a series of films. And then in comes part two where they give a lot more yeah. backstory and the character earn, you know, earns the title Bride in Black. And that's where you come in is you're bringing this character to life and giving us full backstory and showing us the torment and the torture and everything. And that's where I want to hand it over to Andy because we want to know a lot about your character in Insidious 2. Hi, Andy. Hey, Tom. What's your resume and all your diverse roles? It's it's yeah. It, it's the question comes up. Why why did you why would you take on the role of the Bride in Black in Insidious Part Two? My manager that I told you guys about, my friend Eileen, she got me out for this thing, and it was a movie, so I was excited. I had never heard of Insidious. I had never seen Number One, and I just went in to read, and I read with this marvelous scene that they had written uh i learned later of course it was for parker crane uh it was beautiful and my character was called interestingly enough philip on, on the script 
all of my lines were that were, were ascri- as assigned to Philip Friedman. I guess it was Philip. I mean, they called him Philip. And it was a scene between this guy and a mother. I could tell it was a mother. I didn't know it was the mother from, you know, Insidious. Uh, the nurse mother, not the uh, the main lady, but the, the mother who was a nurse. She wound up being played by Barbara Hershey in the present day, I believe. And uh, I didn't know it was a flashback scene, but it was a scene in the elevator between my character, the old guy, and the nurse mother. And she's apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry that my, my boy, you know, upset you. He's just a kid and, you know, he's curious and I have to watch him all the while he gets into things. And I'm saying, oh, no, no, that's all right. That's all right. I'm, I'm kind of excitable. But no, I like kids, actually. No, no, no. And um, I think a little bit more about the little boy, how he's growing up and everything. And then he gets all sort of sad and wistful, my character. Oh, he's having a wonderful childhood. I wish I had the childhood that he's having. All those, uh, those finger paintings of his that you put up on the wall in the bedroom. He's such a lucky little boy to have you. And she let go. She's like taken aback. This old man has never been in the kid's bedroom. How the fuck does he know that? You know? So, and uh, I forget kind of, she kind of keeps the conversation going politely for a couple more lines. And then he, he you know, he bids her goodnight or whatever. And the elevator door is open and out he walks and he's gone. That was the scene as written. Uh, and they didn't tell me anything different. Uh, about two weeks later, at least two weeks later, I was at another audition and my phone rings and that was my manager. Oh, sweetie, sweetie, you booked that movie. Great. What movie? That Insidious movie. Insidious. Which one was Insidious? I didn't remember. Uh, that, that, that horror movie. That, that, oh, that one. Yes, yes, dear. The, you booked it. Well, good. So, you know, and I go over it uh, the night that we're filming. We filmed in a really spooky ass place out here. They used to do a lot of filming in it. It's, I think it was called Loma Vista Hospital, and it was closed in the early 1960s under a cloud. There's always been rumors that people were killed there and incinerated there down in the basement. It was like, yeah, and you could feel the vibe, man. I had shot a music video one night there before I shot Insidious there. And I was scared to death, man, uh, on that music video. I wouldn't go any place unless there was somebody with me and I stayed right in the holding area. I wouldn't go anywhere. It is so damn spooky. And there they were filming Insidious there. But they had, uh, they had taken one or two rooms in the hallway and completely refreshed it. Fresh coat of paint. It looked like a modern hospital a.k.a. a modern hospital in like the 1970s, which is what it's supposed to have been. It was set in the past when Patrick Wilson's character was a little boy, Josh. It's Josh when he's a little boy with his mom. And as you know from the movie, mom brings him to the hospital that day to to show him where mom works. And uh, so I get on set and I'm introduced to James Wan, who's a tiny little man, nice, sweet, tiny very shy, very, very shy, uh, you know, gave me his hand to shake. He maybe said, hey, I'm James. I don't think he said anything more than that. And then he began to instruct me to lie in the bed and be comatose. I'm not even sure when I learned that the reason I was comatose was because I tried to castrate myself the night before. Maybe that's why when they told me. I didn't get a script of the movie and all I had were the pages of the scenes I was going to film. So that's all I knew. I guess they must have told me on set, oh, you're comatose because you tried to cut your balls off last night or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so anyway, I lie down and I'm supposed to, when the little boy comes and starts to fool around with my pill bottles on my bedside table, I'm supposed to sit up and scream and grab him and hold him for dear life and orderlies are going to come and pull me off so i did it we rehearsed it uh i had to have uh, a guy grab my feet so i could sit bolt upright i mean i do sit-ups but i'm not 
as young as I used to be. So I have to like hook my feet under something if I'm going to do sit-ups. So every time they would say action and the kid would get there and be doing his thing with the pill bottles. There was some agreed upon cue, which I can't remember. Bam, the guy would grab my feet. Bam, I would sit up. Bam, I would scream. And uh, I think they, they assigned two or three extras playing orderly to pull me off. And uh, I really held on. I didn't hurt the kid, but I held on really hard so they'd have a hard time. Uh, and then I would you know, be comatose again. We rehearsed it a number of times to get the timing right. And then James went back to the camera to get his set up. Uh, and then we shot it several times. But while we were shooting, James, like, vanished. Gone. <laughs> and I think, finally, I said, uh, where's the director? <laughs> and it turned out that that was his last day of work, his last hour and minute of work on Insidious 2. He was going out the door to go to wherever you have to go to be medically examined and get your shots to go overseas to certain countries in order to shoot over there. And he was going to be shooting Fast and Furious 7 overseas. So he had, he had left. He was out of there. He was over. It was all over. I had the last minutes with James Wan on Insidious 2, as far as I know. I think I did. And... The first AD took over. He was a terrifically nice man. He, uh, we shot several more go rounds, just the same thing, but fine tuning. And then it was wrapped. Uh, that was uh, a, a wrap on that uh, sequence. And then we did the elevator thingy. It was movie magic. The elevator they just made in the hall. They put in two doors, which separated. I didn't think there was even a backing to the elevator because they wanted to have cameras there. They shot from the side and they shot from behind. They wanted to have the doors opening, but they never shot back at us. So there was even no backing in the, in the phony elevator. But the doors would open and it was uh, set up as a reception area then. So uh, the doors would open and uh, out I would get and the, the nurse would come out. So then I swear to Christ, when we get on the set, I am informed that I'm not going to do any of my dialogue even though they had sent me the script. <laughs> I was a little bummed. And, of course, you get all paranoid. You think, my God, do they think I can't act it? Do they think I, they think I can't cut it? And then I calmed myself down. I mean, they cast me because I apparently acted the scene really good. But in their wisdom, and it really was wisdom, they decided it would be a lot spookier if it was just the nurse mom talking to this old geezer, uh, apologizing for the little kid. And, and talking about him, but Parker doesn't say anything. He's just there, doesn't even listen to her, doesn't look at her, you don't even know if he hears her, and, and the door's open, and he just walks out, and he goes down the hall, and the camera follows him, and then she comes off the elevator, and she goes to the charge nurse at the desk, and you know the scene, she said, isn't that amazing? Mr. Crane was comatose yesterday, and now he's up and walking around, and of course the charge nurse says, what are you talking about, dear? Mr. Crane, he was, you know, he was at death's door yesterday, and he just went down the hall. And she says, darling, Mr. Crane died last night. Whoa, so spooky. So it really worked better to not have me talk. So I was cool with that. And then as far as I know, they and, and I think that same day, we maybe shot a scene up in another room in the horrible hospital, which was not dressed. It was spooky as hell just the camera and uh, a bit of light and the crew. And I was to lie on my tummy on the floor and I was to grab two bars at the base of the camera and strangle them for dear life. And I guess it was just a tight of me strangling Patrick. I was told that he was in the other room and they were filming him reacting to being strangled, but they never put us together. I never met Mr. Wilson. Uh, so we did that. And then they had me back, surprisingly enough, for another day. And we were in an old house over in, uh, oh, what is it called? I think it's called the Adams District. It's very, very, very old houses from the, the turn of the, of the last century. Beautiful old houses. Some of them are wonderfully kept up. A lot of them are not kept up. And the one they, had, they were using was not kept up. It was a ruin. Again, spookier than hell, man. It was so spooky. 
And that's where I do the scene where I uh, put my costume on, my makeup on, and I pick up my chromium saw and I go across and I'm going to cut that poor little girl's throat. I think they wrote that scene as an afterthought. And of course, uh, James was gone by then, so the direct, that really nice guy, you had to find his name in IMDb, I can't remember it. Uh, and that was fun, man. <laughs> I start out in a wife beater t-shirt and really unflattering big old grandpa shorts. And uh, I was allowed to do, they did all of my makeup down to look like my chin or my, or my chin. I was allowed to make up my whole lower chin and put my lipstick on, which I did. And they photographed all of that. I was told afterwards that it drove the makeup woman crazy. <laughs> she was a great artist, Eleanor Sabadukia. She always did the makeup from from uh, the old woman through all of the insidious. She always did it. It was a work of art. It took two hours. And I was told that it drove Eleanor crazy because I put my lipstick on kind of nice, man. I wanted to look like Joan Crawford or somebody. And whenever, whenever Eleanor would do it, she would always take great pains to artistically mess it up like some old old lady who'd been out on the streets for a while in her makeup. And the the lipstick was going up into her, and there were whistle lines, and it was blurry and messed up. Well, I wasn't having any of that that day, so I put my makeup on good, because I'm sure she did when she do her makeup bad, the black ride. She just she put it on good, and then uh, I did the whole thing of putting on every piece of the costume, and then putting on the wig, putting on the veil, and then I go over and I pick up the uh, the chromium saw. And I bear down on this beautiful, sweet young lady, and I'm going to cut her throat, cut her head off with that cha that saw or whatever. So I think they made that whole scene up after I had shot the first thing. So, I mean, I don't know if I inspired them, but sometimes I let myself think that, and that pleases me. But anyway, I thought that those guys did an amazing job of fleshing out that character. If you lay it all end to end, I probably have maybe five minutes on the screen and they tell such an affecting backstory. It's amazing how they do that. And they made the the bride so real. And I still talk to like some fans and they remember old Parker Crane. Jesus Christ, you know, they remember Parker Crane. They remember that I'm two separate personalities. Uh, so all props to James and, and Lee One L. They are they're extraordinarily good storytellers. I, I love that. So that that was my experience the first time around. There was no big hoopla about the opening that I knew of. If there was, I wasn't invited to it. I just went to a preview screening uh, downtown LA. And I'm kind of like weird when I see myself my few times on the screen on in movies. I'm so nervous waiting for my appearance. And then when I turn up, I'm so nervous that I can't even see myself. So I don't remember anything about seeing it the first time. I've seen, you know, clips of it since then. And I think I'm pretty good and all that. But I didn't, I don't remember anything about that first screening. Then we shot uh, number three and I was honored to be asked back. My first day on that, this time, I I, I don't know why they did that. Maybe they had a little more bucks because they built their entire set on a stage. They had uh, all of the rooms of the further. I think they had all of the rooms of the family's house all built on a stage up in uh, up in Silmar. Uh, big, huge stage full of the insidious set. I don't know why they would do that, except maybe you can control things better. And maybe it's actually economically more feasible to buy, to build a set than to go on location and mess around with all of that. I don't know. It's amazing the the wisdom of people that make movies. I, I always stand back and just in wonderment. I don't know how they do it. So uh, first thing was a scene someplace in the further. And I have to strangle Lynn Shea, whom I've never met. And uh, both of us were so nervous. She was afraid I was going to hurt her. I was afraid I was going to hurt her. So it was all about making Lynn feel comfortable. And it was really difficult because she was 
really scared the whole time, and I was really scared as a consequence the whole time. We had a stunt guy helping us, uh, and we must have rehearsed it for a half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Then they put the camera in. We had to run it again for the camera and all of that stuff for positioning. And then we had to do several, several, several takes because it ends up with her throwing me off. And after I've said, this is how you die, and she says, not today, bitch. So it was kind of a long action sequence with a nervous actor and a nervous actress. So it was hard. It was a very hard couple of hours on the set. She was a great gal. I mean, she was fine, but she was understandably afraid that she would get hurt. And I was afraid that I'd hurt her. So I was really glad when they said, moving on. Yes, Lord. Uh, so then I hung out on the set because she was going to film another scene. And it was the scene in the, uh, it's in that hotel room scene in the further where she confronts her husband. At first, you think it's her dead husband, and she's all, you know, sad and so happy to see him and all that jazz. And then she realizes he's a demon, and she whips out a knife, and she kills him. They shot that all in one chunk every time they would do it, even though they would do coverage and then cover him and cover her. And that woman put out every time. She is such a pro. She never, ever, ever let down. It was an amazing thing to see. She is uh, a lesson to us all. She was just amazing. So uh, I just stood in awe. I was really like just taken aback. She was good boy. And then I think before the thing opened, we had a day. She and I spent a day together because they were making a virtual reality thing of uh, the scene. And it was mostly Lynn talking. And it was a, 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 the, the setting was a, a room someplace in the further, I guess. But of course, the old black bride turns up. It, she's got the candle which i never used in either of the two that i did that was that was philip's uh shtick from uh part one from the old woman but didn't i turn up with a damn candle i don't think i did anything to her i think i just walked through with a candle and blew it out or something that's all i did but i hear that's pretty good i've never seen it uh and then the last time i collided with all of the kind people from insidious they decided to have a big premiere of the thing up on hollywood boulevard at Grauman's Chinese Theater. I was in heaven, and they wanted the bride to be there in the drag and have her just, like, work the crowd. Oh, God, that was fun. I was so grateful. They paid me. They uh, put me into a room at the Roosevelt Hotel across the street, which is an old hotel from 1927 in Hollywood where they had the first Academy Awards ceremony. Oh, and it's so gorgeous it still looks like 1927 and they got me all done up in my makeup and madame sabadukia was there again to make sure i looked right and my lipstick was messy and uh then i was taken downstairs where i had to meet uh what do they call it not pace setters there's some word in marketing paste makers i don't know what they're called but they're like people who oh I think maybe they're called influence makers, influencers. I was to meet rooms full of influencers as the Black Bride. Sweet. That was fun. There was like, you know, a hundred bunches of a hundred people in each one of these beautiful old 1920s rooms. And I'm wafting through as the Black Bride. And everybody and their dog wanted to be photographed with the Black Bride. And then I said, well, let's do something. This is boring just standing here. So I would always, like, strangle them. I took to strangling everybody. Well, that was really popular. I think I probably strangled 200, 300 people that night, all told. <laughs> and everybody that was at that event has got a selfie of them being strangled by the Black Bride. So I did the influencers, and then he took me across the street to Grauman's Chinese Theater, where they had the red carpet and the big lights and the, the, the crazy thing that you get photographed in front of, and all the paparazzi. And people went crazy when I turned up. And, it, you know, I am wise enough to know that it's not me. It's the character. And, again, all props to James and Lee. People love that character. They were yelling and screaming and... I think I had more paparazzi photos taken of me <laughs> than any of the people who were not in their makeup. 
and I had a pose with Lynn, and I had a strangle Lynn, and I had a pose with Jason Blum, and I had a pose with Lee Wanell. James, I don't think even came. James is really shy. He doesn't. He doesn't go for that stuff. He was probably directing some other movie somewhere, but Lee likes it. Oh, he directed the second well, uh, number three, the second one that I did, number three. And he's the salt of the earth. I should say that. God, I loved laugh, uh, working with him. He he loves to laugh. He's he loves to smile. He loves to laugh. And he's Australian and full of that Australian energy. It was really fun. He's a great guy. So anyway, he was all over that red carpet that night. And I was frequently photographed with him. And then I had to go around and strangle my way around the courtyard. And I had two, I guess they were TV interviews, which I think are up on my uh, IMD site. Yeah, you can see me making a fool of myself with those nice young ladies. That's fun. But that was my my moment of glory as, as the Black Bride. That was really the sweetest payoff for it. And they paid me money to do it. I, I would have done it for free. I had so much fun. <laughs> so I guess that's the end of my road with the Black Bride because now they've made four and they have to they have to move on. And I did get exercised. You can't come back from an exorcism after all. But uh, gosh, I had fun and I'm grateful for the experience. But, you know, I've had another experience that I'm grateful for too. I told you guys I, I played Kevin Hart's old butler on Real Husbands of Hollywood for nine episodes. And uh, people recognize me from that. So that's fun, too. So, And I did hear a rumor that maybe Mr. Hart might revive the series. So maybe I'll come back as a butler, if not the Black Bride. So that'll be fun. Meanwhile, I might be shooting something on Friday. Uh, the Mayor. There's a new series called The Mayor. I don't know if it's airing yet or not. Had a, a nice ro- read for a nice role on that. Nice speech. And uh, I got a call that I was, there's a phrase out here in Hollywood that I just hate. They call it pinned. I was pinned for it. That means you're probably one of three guys, and <laughs> depending on who they can get and who, everybody has to look at you. The producers look at you. The writers look at you. The directors look at you. They all look at your tape. And so you're pinned until finally they get a consensus and everybody says, okay, yeah. That old guy, Tom, he's good. Let's get him. Then they pull the pin out and you get the call and you get to work. So I've still got a pin in me for the mayor. So hopefully I get it. Uh, if they if they want me, I work on Friday. So I'm waiting to hear. That's awesome. I mean, it's fascinating just to see your journey, you know, from where you started to where you are now. I mean, it's great. Uh, and I think our listeners will appreciate that. So, yeah. So, Tom, we want to thank you for coming on the show today and, and giving you. us some insight into who you are and and who the Black Bride was. and uh, 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 uh. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Well, thank you for talking to me. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And thanks to all of our listeners out there for tuning in to this episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that me and Dave really enjoyed talking to Tom and Steve. They're both great actors and just uh, ask that you guys go out there and, and check out all their other projects that they have going on. And also, uh, I wanted to let you guys know I've got a listener appreciation sale going on right now in the Black Cat Shadow Movie Store. Uh, now through the end of the month, if you spend $20 or more, you get 20% off your order. And it's always free shipping on everything that I sell in there. It's just a way for us to get some extra money to come in to help pay for the, the cost of doing the podcast. Um, and to take advantage of that sale, um, there's a link that you have to click on. So just go to either our Twitter page or our Facebook page, and it'll be the pinned post on there. We'll have the link that you click on. So you just click on that and do all your shopping through there, and you'll get the discount. So I appreciate it, guys. You can find us out there on social media on Twitter, at Black Cat Podcast. Uh, you can find Phantom Dark Dave on Twitter. Uh, he is at Phantom Dark Dave. And you can also find us out there on Facebook. Just look up Black Cat Shadow and you'll find our page. We just have a page uh, where we do post some stuff. We don't have a group right now. I don't know, maybe in the future. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then uh, you can find us on Horror Amino as well. We post occasionally there. Whenever we put out an episode, we'll do a, a post about the episode on there. And you can also email us at blackcatpodcast at gmail.com. 
And you can also send Dakota an email at dakshadowbane at gmail.com. That's D-A-K-S-H-A-D-O-W-B-A-N-E at gmail.com. And I'm sure people are wondering where Dakota's at. He is still a part of the podcast. Um, it's really my fault. I need to figure out how to uh, get him on more episodes with his schedule and the way that we did the interviews. He was not available for to be on these interviews. So, uh, you know, it's my fault. Uh, I need to figure out a better way to get him on these episodes because I miss having him on these episodes. As I'm sure you all miss him being on these episodes too. So we're going to try to do some more general chat episodes where we, where all of us can be on there um, and do some other interviews where Dakota is available to be a part of that. And you can check out our website at www.blackcatshadow.com where you'll find all of our past episodes that we've released. And you'll also find links to download them from iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, and even our YouTube channel. So go check that out. So remember, guys, is to take a closer look at the world around you And you may just find that it is stranger and more mysterious than you thought, especially in the Black Cat Shadow. (laughs) 